couldn't see. Okay, good evening, everyone. I would like to say hi to our guest, Professor George Fisher from Stanford. He's here to talk to us about plea bargaining and to tell us about all his experience in proof, in evidence. And I really, really want to thank you for being here with us. We are the National Magistrature School. We graduate and improve the magistrates. We are within the National Association of Magistrates, which is the biggest uh, entity for judges everywhere. We have 14,000 judges that work with us. And before uh, we start, Professor, I want to talk to you about uh, Judge Anderson Paiva. Welcome. He's a magistrate in Rio de Janeiro. Everyone here, they are professors. Rogério Sanchez, who knows very well the modern systems for law. He teaches law to thousands of Brazilian students. He is a, a judge, and he is also a writer of many books. I would like to say hi to welcome Humberto Dalla, Judge Humberto Dalla. I've learned so much from him, and now he is part of the Justice Court of Rio de Janeiro. Welcome, Salve Lai. He's also a professor, and I've also worked with him in Rio de Janeiro. So I want to uh, welcome my colleagues. There are more than 300 judges, and it's very interesting. And it started within our school and has been so well conduced by Judge Caetano Levy. He, even during the pandemic, has been doing such amazing work, taking education to so many magistrates in Brazil. And he's been working with Marcela Bocaiuva, who's the executive coordinator. But I want to thank you, Judge Caetano, for this amazing classes you've been teaching us and showing that the National Magistrate School is within the right temple. And I would like to say, Professor George, that we are very proud to be part of this very independent magistrature here in Brazil because we have a constitutional right that protects their judicial independence. And your teachings will be really very relevant to this independence in the judiciary here in Brazil. Many people ask and question our decisions. We have many criminal authorities that involved many bad people in Brazil, and we got through all these problems and now we are post what we call the lava jato and we introduced into our law system important mechanisms for the criminal process in brazil to be more serious i've read what you wrote about this very interesting subject i've seen that you started working for drink and drive in boston using that and you dealt with the efficiency of this institute when there is a confession from the accused. I was very happy to read all about that. I've been a judge, a criminal judge in Rio de Janeiro, and I've been for 24 years. We have always made deals between the promoter and the judges. When the when the, they say you know that they are guilty everything works so much better they are very aware of everything that's been happening they talk to the defendant and if he wants to talk there is a conversation between the defendant and the judges about what will be they are 
processes. We judged uh, seven out of 10 processes. We go through a deal and then having a definitive sentence for this defendant and for him to even know when he would actually be able to leave the prison. So we've been doing this work in a way that it's not regulated yet, but in a way that we are able to support and humanize justice and to protect the fundamental rights and human rights. Of course, when we have an institute such as plea bargaining, which is well structured within the Brazilian system, and we already have some news that will be talked about throughout this class, all of this is even better. And there is a certainty from the point of view of the law that we want and we seek in our judicial system to guarantee safety and security. I want to thank as the professor, as the president from the AMB uh, for this amazing class from Professor George from Stanford University, which I've been able to visit and know more about this amazing school. So just reminding all of you that the professor has got many prizes within his university. So it's an amazing opportunity to be with such a special person for the Pino uh, law world. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very kind invitation. I'm very happy to be here, very honored to be invited, and uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. And I uh, would love to talk about plea bargaining in the United States. Um, as you all know, the United States really is a system of plea bargaining in our penal system at this point. Uh, in our state system, about 95% of cases uh, handled criminally and in guilty pleas and in our federal system, about 97%. Uh, the, the Supreme Court has acknowledged that we really have a system of plea bargaining and no longer have in the United States a system of trials. And it's not because at any point along the way, any legislature in the United States created a system of plea bargaining. It was not a legislative creation. It was a creation of the actors within the system. And that's because, as you all know, plea bargaining benefits all of the actors in the system. For prosecutors, plea bargaining means a vastly reduced workload, means certain victory. It means that when they stand for re-election, they can go to their voters and say, my conviction rate is 96, 97, 98%. Uh, the voters may not know that all of those convictions come from plea bargains, but that is what um, the prosecutors can say when they go up for re-election. And for judges, uh, of course, again, plea bargaining means a greatly reduced workload. It also means that they don't have the risk of being reversed on appeal because they can't make the sorts of errors that judges can make during trials. They don't therefore incur the possibility that an appeals court will demand that the trial be done over again. For defense lawyers, um, for public defenders, the, the reduced workload is very apparent. They can save an awful lot of time if most of their cases end in guilty pleas, uh, and then use that time that they have saved for those few clients they believe to be innocent and therefore deserving all of the time that a trial would require. For private defense lawyers, plea bargains mean they actually make much more money. Uh, unfortunately, most uh, private lawyers demand a certain lump sum fee paid in advance by their clients. And when cases end in plea bargains, they make more money per hour than they could possibly make if they had engaged in a long drawn out trial. And so with all the actors in the system liking the system of plea bargaining, it's very, uh, very well dug in and would be very difficult for any legislature to try to eradicate 
although sometimes legislatures have tried, but not without, not with any success. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the history of plea bargaining in the United States, and then come back and talk a little bit more about the actual practice of plea bargaining in the United States today. Uh, but plea bargaining began in the United States pretty much as early as public prosecutors took hold in the United States. In the, in the old common law system, we did not have public prosecutors. Crime victims were responsible for bringing prosecutions on their own or the families of the crime victims in the case of homicides. Uh, but back toward the beginning of the 19th century, public prosecutors began to be common. And many years ago, I studied closely a jurisdiction in eastern Massachusetts, which is in the northeastern United States. And in that jurisdiction, in the, in the state of Massachusetts, public prosecutors were appointed beginning in 1807. And just a year later, in 1808, one can find in the records uh, plea bargainings taking place. And they became more and more prevalent until about the 1840s when they really exploded and became a very substantial part of the of criminal resolutions in the United States. And it turns out that where the prosecutors began to find the power to prosecute was in those sorts of cases where the legislature had prescribed penalties that judges could not alter. So across most of the criminal code, judges had at the time and still do today in the states, quite broad discretion in sentencing. The average crime, for example, would draw a penalty from zero to five years or zero to 10 or zero to 20. And judges would have the discretion to pick a sentence within that range. But there were some crimes for which the legislature prescribed very specific penalties. And there were two examples at either end of the criminal spectrum. At the less severe end, there were violations of the liquor laws. And back in the early 19th century, almost every jurisdiction in the United States regulated the sale of liquor. There weren't many jurisdictions that were banning liquor sales, but almost all tried to constrain liquor sales. And those, at least in Massachusetts, the legislature had prescribed very specific penalties so that violations would carry a fine that the judge could not alter. So these weren't serious cases, but the fines ranged from $20 to $100. But at the time, in the early 19th century, that was a fairly substantial amount of money. But judges could not, some, some of those violations carried a fine of $20. Some of them carried a fine of $100, but the judge no, had no discretion over that fine. And at the other end of the criminal spectrum, in the case of murders, judges also had no discretion. First degree murder was a capital offense. It called for a mandatory death penalty and judges could not alter it. So in those two kinds of, of, of criminal prosecutions, prosecutors have the power to plea bargain. They have that power because in the US system, only prosecutors can lodge charges, can bring charges. And only prosecutors can drop charges without any excuse. They, they simply can say, I simply choose not to prosecute, even if I have previously chosen to bring a prosecution. Prosecutors have that discretion. Judges can't constrain them. They can't make prosecutors bring charges, and they can't make prosecutors drop charges. And they can't stop for prosecutors from dropping charges. And so prosecutors have a lot of power as long as those charges come with fixed sentences. And so in the case of liquor law violations, prosecutors learn that they could bring not one charge, but four or five charges, and then say to the defendant, if you plead guilty or no contest, uh, and we say no low contendere sometimes, to some of these charges or to even one of these charges, I will agree not to prosecute on the others. And so if I, I'm gonna to try to share my screen, I, I don't know if this will work, but let me see if I can pull up the software and make this work. Um, apparently not, I'm seeing two pictures of myself and no pictures of my document, but let me, let me just try. 
to see if I can bring up over here a different camera. Okay, that's better. So um, I think these other images will go away in a moment. Let me just share. Can you can you all see my document? Thumbs up or not? No. Okay, so let me. You can. No, not yet. Not yet. Okay, so let me share the we screen. Can, we no. can see it, Doctor. All right. Okay, so. Not Eventually, let me pull this out of the way. Então, quando a gente mexe... Okay, and I'm going to just... I, all right, so what you see here, let me... This is a, an indictment form from 1843. Now, I know you can't read the detail from there, but I want... I'm hoping you'll take away from this picture a few things. Uh, kind of bring this into better focus, though. There we go. Okay, so what you might see here is uh, a pre-printed form. So this is from the 1840s, 18, uh, 1843. Um, and the prosecutor in this jurisdiction, a man who has signed the form at the bottom, his name is Huntington, is lodging a lot of liquor law violations. So he creates a pre-printed form. And this pre-printed form has five paragraphs in each paragraph alleges a separate count. Let's see, that's three, four, and five. And each of these charges carries a penalty from $100 for the first to just $20 for the, each of the others. And so what the prosecutor could say after bringing a, a, an indictment that looks like this, is that if you plead guilty to one of these charges, I will not go forward and prosecute the others. Now, by the 1840s, this was a very prevalent practice, and the legislature in Massachusetts began to learn that this practice was going on and disapproved and started an investigation of Mr. Huntington, the prosecutor, and hauled him before the legislature and said, we wrote these laws, we prescribed these penalties, and you're letting defendants get away without paying the full penalties they owe and tell us why you're doing this. And Mr. Huntington said, well, you're right, I'm doing this. And I'm doing this because I have an enormous workload and a workload that it looks like this. So in 1840, the caseload in his jurisdiction began to skyrocket probably because of the establishment around the same time of professionalized police forces. And so suddenly many more cases were coming into the system. And he said, I can't handle this workload, especially because you legislators don't pay me a full-time salary. My salary is meant to be part-time. On the, on the side, I still have my private law practice and that's where I make most of my money. So I can't spend all my time prosecuting. So I've devised a system where I say to defendants, and the legislature took notes and the legislature recorded that this was his system. So this is the, from the 1845 report of the legislature regarding the investigation of the district attorney Huntington. And he said, here's my system. I, I say first, I tell the defendant, you can enter a plea of no contest or no lay, no low contendering. If you do that to one count, I and you agree to re, uh, abstain from future sales of liquors without a license, and you pay at least one penalty to the state or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and you pay all the all the costs of court. Then I will place the indictment on hold. I won't drop the indictment, but I'll place it on hold as a security to be sure that you, the defendant, fulfill your agreement. And I won't prosecute you anymore as long as you obey the law in the future. And this was my system, the prosecutor said. And the legislature heard all this and they rendered a report. And at the end of the report, 
the, their investigation, they said, well, this seems like a pretty good system to us. It wasn't secret. It wasn't covert. It was known by all the persons coming into the court that this was the system. And it does seem like a good way of handling the cases. And so the legislature let this practice continue. And note that the two things were invented in this process. One is plea bargaining, or actually charge bargaining here. We'll get to that distinction in a moment. But the other is probation, because this system of holding the indictment in abeyance while the defendant was held to good behavior, with the risk that if the defendant offended again in the future, the indictment would be refreshed, that system is effectively the system of probation. It was invented by prosecutors in the process of plea bargaining. So here's what was going on in the realm of liquor law violations. And then beginning in, in the year 1848, so still 170, almost 175 years ago, there was plea bargaining, or again, really charge bargaining, in a murder prosecution. So here is in the, in the highest court of Massachusetts, a prosecution of a man named Golden, um, who was charged with having murdered his wife. And he initially pled not guilty to this charge. And then after considering the options he had, he came into court and after initially having pled not guilty, and asked for a trial, um, and having been appointed counsel by the court, so the court assigned counsel to him. And then the, 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 the court records continue, and afterwards, later, Mr. Goulding retracts his plea of not guilty and says he is guilty, but not of murder, of manslaughter. And the prosecutor, who's now a man named Train, says that in exchange for that guilty plea to manslaughter, he will no further prosecute this indictment as to murder. And so the court then sentenced Mr. Goulding to a term in the House of Correction of just two years. Now, had Mr. Goulding gone to trial on the murder charge and been convicted, he would have been hanged. There was no other option. It was a, a capital charge, and there was no other sentencing provision besides execution. But by pleading guilty to manslaughter, he faced a potential penalty of zero to 20 years. But he walked out a very lucky man, just two years in the House of Correction. By the 1860s, 40% uh, of murder cases in Massachusetts were resolved by guilty plea. By the 1890s, 60%. And by the 1890s, overall in the criminal code in Massachusetts, 87% of felony prosecutions ended in guilty plea. That's by the end of the 19th century. Well, one other thing had to happen before plea bargaining could spread so broadly. And that was judges had to get in on the system. Because without judges, all of those crimes where judges had the discretion to sentence from zero to 10 or zero to 20, those crimes couldn't be plea bargained without the judge's participation. But toward the end of the 19th century, something else happened, and that is railroads and streetcars and heavy industrialized machinery became very prevalent. And with all of that heavy equipment, there were many, many personal injury lawsuits. And in Eastern Massachusetts between 1880 and 1900, the case rate in terms of civil lawsuits increased 2,700 percent. 27 times as many cases were brought in civil courts at the end of the 19th century, meaning judges were overwhelmed and they had to make, they had to e economize where they could. And where they could economize was by taking part in plea bargaining on the criminal side. And so by this time, in most urban jurisdictions in the United States, by the end of the 19th century, plea bargaining had become the had taken over the vast majority of criminal prosecutions. 
Now, in 1928, that's the next stop in our historical process, there was a, a famous law journal article published uh, by a Columbia law professor, Columbia University in New York, um, called The Vanishing Jury. And this law professor in 1928 looked around the country and he said, there are no more jury trials. Well, there were some, but there weren't many. Um, because by 1928, everybody was in on the game. Um, in the early 1920s and the late 19 teens, one other thing had happened. And that is the public defenders began to be institutionalized in the United States. Uh, Mr. Goulding, having been charged with a capital offense, was appointed counsel by the court. But those counsel were, were private lawyers. But in the 19, between 1918, 1925, public defenders began to be institutionalized. And one of the ways they established themselves and drew the funding they needed to become institutionalized was by promising that they would take part in the plea bargaining system, that they would help make the system economical by making their guilty clients plead guilty and by reserving trials only for their innocent clients. And so we have some very interesting language now. Here's from 1917 to 1918, uh, a, a statement published by the head of the Voluntary Defenders Committee, which was in New York City, the public defender. Um, and, the vol and the head of the public defender in New York City said, when a voluntary defender, meaning a, a member of my office, finds that he has a guilty man on his hands, meaning when the defendant's guilty, my lawyer will not set out to acquit him. You don't get a defense if you're a guilty person. Rather, the first essential step toward improvement or rehabilitation is a confession of guilt. That's from the defense lawyers saying that. And here on the other side of the country in Los Angeles, the annual report of the Los Angeles Public Defender from 1918, very early on in the history of the Los Angeles Public Defender, in cases where there is no question of the guilt of the accused, it is the established rule of the office that no trial shall be held but that pleas of guilty will be entered, thereby saving the county the expense and delay of trials. That is, the public defender is saying, I'm saving you money if citizens of Los Angeles by pleading out my guilty clients and not making letting them go to trial. And therefore, you should be paying me and my lawyers a salary. That was the deal they were cutting. So by 1928, when Professor Moley and Columbia University looked around the country, he saw that the system of plea bargaining was uniform. Uh, well, almost uniform. It was very broad spread. Now, this is his table, which I know you can't read, but I, I, I want to point out a few things about the table that he published. He's looking around the country in a very time-consuming way. He went from jurisdiction to jurisdiction around the United States and collected data. In New York, he found 88% of the cases in 1928 were ending in guilty pleas. In Chicago, 85%. In Los Angeles, 81%. In some of the smaller jurisdictions, say in in St. Paul, Minnesota, 95%. The only the only outlier, the only place in the country where plea bargaining was still a minority of criminal cases was in my own city, San Francisco, uh, at only 33%. I don't know why that's true, uh, but it's an interesting question. But otherwise, across the United States, plea bargaining had taken over by 1928 when this article was read. So that brings us up to where uh, we are today. And in the United States today, uh, plea bargaining takes two forms. Uh, there's sentencing bargaining, which is simply a, an agreement between either the judge and the defendant or the prosecutor and the defendant, that if you plead guilty to this charge, you will get this sentence. 
rather than some higher sentence that you would get if you insist on going to trial. Or there's charge bargaining, which is really what we've been looking up, up at, up, which is what we've been seeing in, in these old cases from Massachusetts, where the prosecutor says to the defendant, if you plead guilty to this charge, I won't prosecute you on that charge. In the end, they amount to the same thing, which is the defendant is looking for a lower sentence. Normally, that's what the defendant is interested in, is getting a lower sentence. Now, whichever kind of plea bargaining takes place, the, the system looks pretty much the same from there. The defendant must come into court uh, at a hearing in open public court, must acknowledge in open court that the defendant has been presented with the terms of a plea bargain, that the defendant understands those terms, that the defendant has conferred with his lawyer, and the defendant has agreed, and then the judge will list all of the rights that the defendant agrees to give up. And on the record, in open court, the defendant has to waive the right to a trial by jury, the right to remain silent at that trial, the right to cross-examine accusers, the right to use the court's power to bring witnesses to court on the defendant's own behalf. And the defendant has to waive all of those rights. And the judge has to deem that waiver voluntary. It's, it's perhaps intelligence, not necessarily always voluntary given the pressure the defendants are at, under, but in the legal, in the eyes of the law, it's deemed to be a voluntary plea in the sense that the defendant's not under any physical coercion um, to, to waive all those rights. And then the judge will find the defendant guilty and will enter a sentence, um, much as in the ordinary circumstances. There, the great distinction between the state system and the federal system is this. Now, in the United States, about 90% of our criminal cases are tried in the states, about 10% in the federal system. In the state system, in general, judges are fully allowed to take part in the plea bargaining system. Where I am in California, uh, judges will have um, off-the-record conferences with the lawyers back in the judges' chambers, not in the public courtroom, where the judge and the lawyers, uh, the prosecutor and the defense lawyer, will talk about how this case will be resolved. A deal will be struck in the vast majority of cases, and then out in the public courtroom, the terms of that deal will be laid out. In the federal system, judges are barred by law from taking part in the plea bargaining system. All they can do is accept a plea or reject a plea, but they are not allowed to take part in negotiating pleas. The consequence is that in the federal system, prosecutors have that much more power. In the state system, when I was a state prosecutor in Massachusetts many years ago, I could say to a defendant, if you plead guilty, I will recommend to the court a sentence of two years, but nothing better. I'm not going to give you less than two years. But then the judge could look at the defendant and say, well, I'll give you 18 months. I couldn't do anything about that, at least not in those cases where the judge had discretion, zero to five years, zero to 10 years, to create a sentence. But in the federal system, if a defendant wants a plea bargain, the only bargaining partner the defendant has is the prosecutor. And in the federal system, not only do prosecutors have that power because the judge can't take part, but they have a, a, a different sort of power that might begin to look familiar. Old Massachusetts prosecutors got power because the law in certain cases prescribed fixed penalties that the judge could not alter. Back in the 1980s, Congress determined that in the federal system, all criminal offenses should carry fixed penalties, narrowly defined penalties, and that they should vary according to the severity of defenses and according to the defendant's criminal history. And Congress set up a, a sentencing commission that was charged with the task of creating sentencing guidelines. And so, Again, something I know you can't read, but you perhaps can appreciate what this is, what, what, what I'm showing you here. This is the sentencing table of the United States sentencing guidelines that constrains the sentences the judges give 
after a defendant is convicted. There are six columns, numbered one through six, according to the defendant's criminal history. So a defendant who has little or no criminal history is in column one. A defendant who has a very bad criminal history is in column six. And then there are 43 levels distinguishing the various crimes that a defendant may have committed according to their severity. So they're down at the bottom, even if you have a no criminal history, you're still sentenced to life in prison. Whereas up at the top, if you have no criminal history, and this is a very minor offense, really all the way down to level eight, you're eligible for probation for zero time in prison. Um, back when these guidelines took effect in 1987, they were mandatory on judges, meaning judges were constrained to impose the sentence that we would reach if we looked at the intersection of the defendant's criminal history going down and the severity of the crime going over. And in this realm, the top figure could exceed the lower figure by a maximum of 25%. So for example, 100 to 125 months. Um, that was the, the, the only range within which judges typically had the freedom to move. Now these were mandatory until 2005. And then the Supreme Court decreed that as a mandatory system, they were unconstitutional and that they were, that they must be only advisory, that judges did have discretion to go outside this narrow range. But by then judges were used to these guidelines and for the most part judges stay within them. And the consequence of these guidelines, or I think, I think it's likely that the consequence is that the proportion of plea bargains in the federal system in the United States went up and up and up after these guidelines took effect. So here we can begin, and the guidelines took effect in 1987. There was a doubt at the beginning as to, to their constitutionality. The Supreme Court ruled in 1989 that they were constitutional. And then you see that from about 15% of cases going to trial in the years before the guidelines, by 2000, only 6% case, of cases going to trial. By 2010, 3%. So only one fifth as many trials after these guidelines took effect. Now, there might be other reasons why the proportion of trials in the federal system shrank so greatly. But at this point, they have all but disappeared. Federal prosecutors in the United States very rarely go to trial. Uh, there just aren't that many trials left. And prosecutors in the federal system in the United States have a great deal of discretion. So let me talk now a little bit about the criticisms that scholars in the United States raise against plea bargaining. I mean, there are about there are seven, six or seven I'd like to talk about just very briefly. Um, I'm not going to say I agree with all of these. I don't agree with all of them. Some of them, I think, though, are very clearly problems with this system. Um, and things that maybe can be fixed with certain reforms. The, the most worried about risk of this system of plea bargaining is the risk of innocence, that defendants will feel constrained to plead guilty even if they are innocent. I think if we remember back to the case of Mr. Goulden, um, he was charged with murder and he faced either execution after a trial if he was convicted of murder, or he pled guilty to a term of two years in the House of Correction. He may well have been innocent. I doubt he was, given the evidence against him, but he may well have been innocent. Almost anybody would have taken that deal rather than risk execution after trial. So that's the first criticism that is raised. And it's the danger of innocent defendants pleading guilty is going to be greatest when the after trial sentence and the after plea sentence are greatly different. The greater the difference, the more the pressure there is, even on innocent persons, 
to plead guilty. The second criticism raised against the system is the power it places in the hands of prosecutors at the expense of judges. That's worse than the federal system for the reasons I described. The judges were barred from taking part in plea bargaining and because the sentencing guidelines gave prosecutors this discretion to constrain through their charges the sentence judges could give. Prosecutors can bring charges, drop charges, and therefore move all around this board in terms of the sentences they can promise. But judges are constrained by the charges prosecutors bring. So that extra power in the hands of prosecutors is a, the second criticism that is most often uh, leveled at prosecutors. The system encourages prosecutors to overcharge. That DA in Massachusetts who brought that pre-printed form with five separate charges, that was a case of overcharging. That prosecutor had a plan. If I bring five charges, I can leverage a plea to one of them. That's a risk of plea bargaining. Sometimes the accus accusation is made of secrecy. I think that the accusation is a little bit less fair. Uh, it's true that judges will go back in their chambers in our state system and confer privately with the lawyers. Uh, but ultimately, the terms of the deal are laid out in public. The actual plea proceeding is a public proceeding. The press can be present. Anybody can walk into the courtroom and watch these proceedings. So there's nothing secret in the end. Uh, nonetheless, that accusation is sometimes brought. Another criticism, the plea bargaining conceals from the public the true nature of the crimes that were committed. There's a little bit more truth to that. Um, if you're living in a community and you want to know how many robberies are taking place in my community? You can't find that out by looking at court records to see who was convicted of robbery. Because many people who are charged with robbery plead that charge down to a simple theft. You know, robbery is coming up to somebody, threatening force, and taking something from their person. A simple theft could be walking out of the store with something concealed under your jacket. There's a big distinction in severity. Well, criminal records in the United States don't help uh, dis distinguish one of those crimes from the other because we know that the system of plea bargaining and charge bargaining is rampant and our records no longer reflect the true level of criminality in the system. Um, and then finally, uh, perhaps the most worrisome accusation brought against the, the, the system of plea bargaining is that defendants are punished for going to trial. There's a constitutional right to, to a jury trial, and the accusation is made that plea bargaining punishes defendants for ex exercising that right. Now, that accusation may be fair, may not be fair. It all depends on this. A crime is committed. There is a, there is a proper sentence for that crime. We, we don't know what it is, but, but if, if you brought together all of you in a room, all of you experienced judges in a room, and said, here's the defendant, here's this defendant's criminal history, here's the crime the defendant committed, what's the right sentence for that crime? If we averaged out the answer that you all gave to that question, we probably would get to an answer that looks like the right sentence for that crime. Now, if, if plea bargaining is working properly, a defendant who rejects the plea, goes to trial, is convicted, and then sentenced, should get that correct sentence that you all determined was correct. That's the way plea bargaining should happen. And then the defendant who pleads guilty and saves the state and the court the time and the trouble of the trial should be rewarded with a lower sentence, say two-thirds of whatever sentence you all determined was the right one. What's, what's a problem and what would be a, a system that is working badly is if the defendant who pleads guilty gets the right sentence for the crime and the defendant who goes to trial loses and then is sentenced gets a, an additional sentence, a greater sentence on top of that proper amount 
that would be a penalty for going to trial. And that would be an abuse of the system. So in a way, having guidelines is useful because in effect, these guidelines tell us what Congress has determined to be the right sentence for the crime. And then we can decide whether the defendant who pleads guilty is genuinely getting a proper reward, a reduction from that sentence. So those are the criticisms brought. Let me conclude by just listing six or seven suggestions for improving any system of plea bargaining, or at least for improving our system of plea bargaining. I don't know any other system well enough to make suggestions. But in our system, it would be an improvement if in every jurisdiction, there were a way of distinguishing what the right sentence is, and therefore a way of assuring defendants who plead guilty that they are getting a reduction from the proper sentence that they would get if they went to trial and lost. It would be an improvement if defendants were told before they had to decide whether to plead guilty, here is what you will get after a plea. Normally they are told then. Normally they are not told. Here is what you will get after trial. In the state system, where we don't, for the most part, have guidelines like these, defendants who are offered a plea, if you plead guilty, I'll give you five years. And the defendant says, what will I get after trial? All the defendant is told is, a maximum of 20 years, because that's what the statute calls for. And the defendant has no idea what the defendant's risk is if the defendant goes to trial and loses. I think it would be a better system if the judge would say to the defendant, before the plea, if you go to trial and you lose, I'm going to give you seven and a half years. Now you can listen to what the prosecutor is offering you on a, on, a, on a plea. A third fix would be to create a cap on the disparity between the post-plea sentence and the post-trial sentence. So we should not have cases like Mr. Goulding's, you're executed after trial if you lose, but you can plead guilty to two years. The, the temptations for an innocent person to plead guilty is too great. So I, I would suggest some sort of a cap, maybe a 50% increase if you go to trial and lose, maybe a 100% increase if you go to trial and lose, but there should be a cap. So for example, if it's a 50% increase, you can get 10 years after a plea, at most 15 years after trial. That way, innocent defendants insist on their trial, um, believing it more worthwhile to, to try to persuade a jury of their innocence than to take a plea knowing themselves to be innocent. I would allow judges uh, to, to participate fully. I think the federal system's ban on judicial participation puts too much power in the hands of prosecutors. I think judge prosecutors should be required before the plea, before the defendant has to make up a decision about the plea, the prosecutors should be required to disclose any exculpatory evidence, any evidence helpful to the defendants. Prosecutors are required to do that in the United States before trial. They are not required to do so before plea, and I think they ought to be. I think there should be a ban on third-party deals. Uh, these are genuinely abusive. When a defendant is charged and the defendant's spouse is also charged, or the defendant's children also are charged, and the prosecutor says to the defendant, if you plead guilty, I'll drop the charges against your spouse or against your children. Those sorts of pleas create such pressure on defendants to plead guilty that even innocent defendants will feel compelled to plead guilty. Those, I think, should be banned. And finally, um, it's very common in the United States uh, for a, a judge or a prosecutor to say to the defendant, here's your deal. It expires today. If you don't take it today, you, you go to trial and you face whatever you might encounter after trial. But this deal will evaporate at the end of the day. That kind of pressure on people who are negotiating with their liberty, I think, is genuinely unfair. So with all of those reforms I would suggest, I understand that your Congress is now weighing a system of plea bargaining. Um, 
I feel privileged to be able to talk to you about plea bargaining at a time that's so consequential, so consequential in the history of your country. Uh, but that's all I have to say. And I'm, I'm, I now hope to listen and uh, to uh, learn from all of you. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Okay, you are muted. No, not you, doctor, not you, professor, <laughs> somebody else. <laughs> okay, it's good. Sometimes our earphones mute by themselves. We can't hear Fernando, that's why they're all making gestures. Until, let's, I'm going to introduce Professor, Professor George Fisher. We hadn't introduced him formally. He works at Stanford Law School, Stanford, Stanford Law School. He was assistant from the general prosecutor. He was also assistant uh, per, Prosecutor, he's one of the biggest references in the USA when we talk about proof. He researches many criminal institutions, prisons, going through juries, plea bargaining, which is what we are here to talk about, and even regulation of alcohol and drugs. He has written many articles talking about, he has amazing case books for evidence and proof. And he's also had a very, a book that was very impacting to me about the triumph of plea bargaining in the USA. So he told the story of plea bargaining in the USA and he gave us a summary of that in this, in his speech. Apart from that, Professor George is co-director of prosecution clinic, penal prosecution clinic in Stanford, Stanford Law. And for four times he won the award, John Birmingham. And it shows his excellence as a professor. So basically, this is just a summary of his curriculum. It would take us a very long time to read his whole uh, resume, so he's very accomplished and very good. Okay, Fernando still has no sound. I don't know what happened. So he's my friend and my secretary. Uh, so now I will take on his role and I'll pass on the word to Umberto Dalla, a renowned professor. He is a judge in Rio de Janeiro. Before that, he was a justice prosecutor. And I had the chance to work with him when he was still an investigator. So Judge Umberto Dalla, and he's also one of the professors in Rio de Janeiro. I was, I, I had the privilege of working with him before. Thank you very much, Anderson. I say hi to all of you. Caetano Nefilapis. We are here under your safe guidance. And I knew uh, about Professor Fisher. I had read his books and he is an amazing reference and his words come to us at a time which is very relevant and delicate in our legal history. We left the 1990s 
specifically 1995, when we had the law of special judgments, and we had our first contact with the agreement techniques through penal transactions. Our first modality of plea bargaining in the Brazilian law. Then we went to 2013 and we had the Lava Jato and we had the Penal Non Persecution Agreement. I think our translator will have trouble translating that into English because they are generically translated as plea bargaining. So I try to explain that there is no fine tuning for this model, but they're all known as plea bargaining. Um, as I'm the first to talk, I will actually take on a role to really bring on the issues that seem relevant to me so that my colleagues will have the chance to talk about them not just because time is passing, of course, but also for the need and how much we enjoy to hear your opinions. I think the first thing that I got from what Professor Fisher talked is this culture of plea bargaining. All these in many countries that follow common law have a very important helix in this sense, Professor Oscar Chase from New York University has many articles following this line. Professor Geoffrey Hazard Jr., which he co-wrote with Michele Tarufo, also mentioning that. But in the Brazilian law, we still have difficulties to deal with that. We are still a little bit restricted and publicism in the legal cause. And we have the utilitarism versus instrumentalism, which is put by the Arminots, which tools really deliver an efficient uh, result that solve the problem and which ones apparently solve the problem, but that bring on other questions. Another issue that the professor talked about is the issue of the constitutional guarantees. Maybe it's the main criticism of those who are against using plea bargaining. They talk about a deficit which is very high for constitutional guarantees. We have some practical issues, issues, who should take on the initiative of the agreement? Should it always be sought by the defendant or can the public defender take that on? And it wouldn't it be actually putting the defendant in a difficult situation because with one hand they are offering an agreement but they also have they are already accusing him so shouldn't this initiative allow the free manifestation of will there is also the confidentiality issues during the negotiation, whether they are confidential or not. We have confusing rulings when we think about premium collaborative law, the special judgments, which is a bit older, doesn't talk about the subject. Also, we had a sparse perception when we think about this issue. It's, uh, it cuts both ways, you know? And the other issue to register in video and audio, even for them to then be dealt with in the future. And there is a need for corroboration of the manifestation of the collaborator. So it can't be the only proof on which the judge will base himself to condemn. 
do controle judicial. Another issue, it's the exemption of the judicial control. Should there be a judicial control or not? We know that the legal Brazilian system has a, a unionized uh, issue. If the promoter refuses to do that, that can be a big problem. But there's also a unionized problem. And I think that comes, it's becoming stronger. And considering the probability laws, that allows in the civil issues that it follows the MP, and then it's accepted by law. It has got a lot of criticism. Another issue is the need to have objective parameters, which, you, which the Americans call guidelines. In Brazil, if I'm not mistaken, in 2018, maybe somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but the General Prosecutor's Office has had guidelines on how to deal with this, the rules that should be followed by the members of the ministry. There is also this idea to establish that. And then I want to provoke you Knowing that Dr. Anderson likes this theme, I'll pass on the ball to him, you know, see if he wants to take that on. I know Rogério and Sawe like this theme as well, which is the possibility to use algorithms, uh, AI engines to establish these parameters. And we've been, of course, dedicating ourselves to that. Uh, Dr. Fisher talks about, Professor Fisher talks about criminality having a gradation and a rule for intense, inten, intense, intensivity, you know, for us to deal with that, thinking about the right amount of sentences, sentencing. I think we have a very rich material here for us to think about. We all think about our theory marks, our references, our bibliography. So as I'm about to finish renewing all my uh, congratulations to Renata Gil, our president, some of these issues I would like to bring on for us to think about for also everyone who's following up on this. I'm getting messages from my colleagues who are following up. And I pass the word back to Dr. Anderson so that we can continue our uh, talks. I thank you a lot, Professor Umberto Dalla. <clears throat> Sorry. So, uh, you know, really spicing our dialogue up, I'm going to share my screen to bring some data from Brazilian justice that might deepen this discussion we are having. Can you see it? So just for us to understand, Brazil has a very high number of criminal processes just in 2021, 2.2 .2 million of new criminal cases, which have a lot of first degree cases. So we need to take that into consideration. There is a graph of elevation of the numbers involved in the history of new cases and pending cases. It has been stable, but within a very high uh, standard. Corroborating this information, I bring here a screen, a chart that has been done by our our new prosecutor, one of our prosecutors, going from 6,000 processes that have been judged to more than 50,000 judged and distributed in the Supreme Court. And we have so many cases that have been judged and that have gone through. 
this process. So we have more than half a million processes judged just in 2018. In another element for me, this has to do with the average length of the criminal processes. And just on first degree, you can see an average of four years just in the first degree. So if we think about Justice Federal uh, to, um, and also in the state uh, judge, we have just a huge growth in the first degree cases. If we also take into consideration in a second degree, we have about eight months of duration. So that's the average two and a half years. It's the average length of a case. So this is quite high. Of course, the sentencing is uh, it's not a panacea uh, that only includes prison. And I bring you here the average cost of somebody who is uh, incarcerated in Brazil. So not always uh, having them uh, arrested is the best option. And I, we want to improve our criminal justice. And I would show this report from the World Justice Project that analyzes 139 countries with thinking about the general public, but also the law operators. And if we have to have the seventh highest position in the countries we researched, when we think about criminal justice, which is one of the eight factors that are researched, Brazil is on the 112th global ranking. So that's quite bad. And so I want to pass on the word to Sawe Lai. So I want to stop. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. He is a promoter. So he works in the general uh, prosecutor's office from the Republic. He is part of a work group that is very important in this project that we've been debating. And he is the representative of CONAMPI. And he's also been a public defender in Rio de Janeiro before being a prosecutor. So thank you for all your kind words from you, Anderson, I salute you and salute uh, Judge Caetano and everybody else uh, who's on our panel. But a special salute to our guest professor from Stanford. I am from, I studied in Stanford. So I salute you, Professor Fisher. I was paying attention very closely to what he was saying, and I felt very happy with what he was saying, because all his thinking really has to do a lot with our new penal process code that is very similar, as Professor Fisher said, with plea bargaining. As Humberto Dalla said, he is a good friend, and he explained it as we had an experience with the criminal judge, with a, no, a penal non-prosecution system. All these agreements, they are all basically in the USA plea bargaining. <laughs> they are just different ways that we say it here in Brazil. So all these things, when we think about the agreement, that it's after the accusation. So it's similar to sentencing bargaining, which Professor Fisher explained to us. My main worry during the tramit, during this law project that we've been following, was the alteration done in 10th of July, 2021. Dr. Fernando Curi, whom I've met before, and he's been following up 
from AUB, the magistrates, you following the evolution and everything else in the original project and we had involved our minister Armildo Cavagildo we had the article 4.6 that admitted the sentence bargaining in this procedure for crimes with the maximum penalty of eight years maximum sentencing but the chamber of deputies reduced it to half with no more than four years which empties a lot this sentencing bargaining and the summary system with a maximum penalty of four years of course the the demands are that they plead guilty and renouncing the judicial proof so the text of this code says if there is a confession and a renunciation to the proof there is an immediate reduction of of uh, penalty so of course it can't be a private it can't be just um, a sentencing of probation but it has if it's not probation it can be reduced by one third and the professors actually suggested that to avoid pressure and the defendant who chooses um, a trial so we are actually is stimulating sentencing bargaining not with the same uh, penalty of somebody who goes to a trial but we need to talk about this he's also brought something very important which we've been trying to explain the structure of the american process is totally different from the brazilian system when it talks about uh, defendants it's usually a prosecutor who is either elected or indicated by the executive power so he has a political commitment with the needs of their community and many times these needs of the community people usually want uh, the criminals to be punished even stronger so here the prosecutors and the public ministry in brazil chooses independence a functional independence the same way that the brazilian magistrates are composed of members with a public um, uh, there is a public test for people to join so it's a different way to see it and it's uh, doesn't i don't think it works as well another thing that we reflect and that the professor mentioned there is a pressure to avoid uh, a full trial because there there are uh, sentencing that are very severe such as death penalty perpetual uh, sentencing and also the the day in proof now in the usa they have to follow to to go through 85 percent of their penalty before they can get into probation so just for us to conclude that the suggestion i made to the chamber of deputies and i am very happy to hear professor fisher because those were the things that he suggested to improve plea bargain in the usa and his suggestions i've also made the suggestions in the chamber so for us to demand in the penal code to have mandatory questions i have been able to talk to some judges from california where professor fisher teaches in stanford and the the judges actually gave the suggestion there is there are uh, some questions that must be made that the judge must make 
to guarantee or at least diminish, minimize the risks of a sentencing of an innocent, such as questions about the negotiation, whether he's had access to the full proof that had been collected throughout the political investigation. You actually suggested this in his closing. And apart from the circumstances, there are also mandatory questions about the clarity of the consequences of the agreement, especially the consequences relating to the sentence that will be fixed when coordinated and its difference from the sentence negotiated by a third should he choose the sentence in bargaining. I'm not sure with plea bargaining, but with sentencing bargaining. And just to finish what I'm saying, a theme that it's very important to me, and Umberto Dalla talked about that, is the use of artificial intelligence, which the USA and China, uh, they are two countries uh, who are very advanced with technology for criminal justice. And I've, no, I've heard that an AI program, which is called Compass in the USA, which calculates through some data collected from a database, the probability of recurrence. Especially, I think it's been used in Wisconsin. I would like for the professor, if he could, maybe explain his opinion about the Compass program, which uh, has been suspended. And what does he think of the use of AI as a tool for us to lower these um, this huge numbers that Dr. Anderson has brought to us, this huge volume that the criminal justice in Brazil is facing. So thanks a lot for the invite for the words, Professor Fisher. And now I will pass on the word to my dear friend, uh, Dr. Anderson. Thank you, Professor Saway. We are having a very enriching evening here. That's the only way for people to stay with us at night when there are many events, including Rock and in Rio here in Rio. So I'll pass it on to Rogério Sanchez Cunha. He is a judge from Curitiba, and he also works with the justice uh, promoter. And he's written many books. He works with the district attorney, and he has some amazing material. So please, Rogério. The word is yours. So, good evening, everyone. I want to salute Professor George Fisher. I thank you. We had such an amazing class, so I feel enriched. I want to thank you all for the invitation to Judge Anderson that uh, I come here because, of course, one of the reasons is our friendship. Also, Umberto Dalla, I'd also like to salute Judge Fernando Curi. And he's had an, inform, uh, an information technology problems. He's not getting his audio. I am against death penalty. But in the case of IT, sometimes I rethink it. <laughs> so, salve, I salute you. I really admire you a lot, and I only have five minutes, so I'm going to get on. I've got four and a half minutes now. I am computing my saluting. So, I was listening very closely to the lessons from Professor Fisher, and we realize that it doesn't matter the name that we give to the instrument of this agreement. And in Brazil, Professor Fischer, we have many tools for this agreement. Uh, even for you all to understand my suggestion, Brazil has many tools for agreements. But when I listen to the lesson from Professor Fisher, it's evident uh, 
that this recall that it's been suggested to the North American system, it means that we want to give to the system more predictability and judicial safety. I am summarizing, of course, but I believe that I've understood that they are two important processes that need to exist in the American system and that Professor Fisher thinks about that. And I would like to suggest a bigger participation from the judge. And I remember what Salve Eli has mentioned, our system is a little bit different. And Professor Fisher, we've done our homework by learning so much from the American system which has the justice negotiated and it's been like that for two centuries and brazil is working with negotiated justice only since 1995 so of course we had to look at the north american system but it is a system that needs to be studied and we've done our homework very well professor fisher in brazil we have a control that is very satisfactory of the judge over these agreements and these bargainings. Every bargaining, plea bargaining has to be accepted by the judge and they have some time that they spend with the defendant to understand uh, if he it was really volunteered. So I defend that in the solemnity, the prosecutor shouldn't participate. This has to be between the judge and the defendant so that he will notice whether this agreement was built as voluntary and with freedom. This is very important. And of course, here in Brazil, we have people saying that the judge should not join the adequation and the convenience of the clauses that were agreed on. I believe that we can reach, you know, a middle ground. We can even admit the judge without violating the accusation system. This agreement has some clauses that are absurd, that are not adequate, that are insufficient, but as long as the magistrate acts like that, refusing to accept the agreement, makes the district attorney really rethink this process. So I think there need to be controls from the public ministry, by the public ministry, and then the judge will provoke the prosecutor and say in this agreement that your district attorney has done, uh, has terrible clauses. So we can't escape what the judges think. So before quickly saying what my suggestion is, I saw this graph from, Ju from Anderson, Ju Judge Anderson, especially when he brought this increase in process for the Supreme Court and Allow me, with being very honest, I think the Supreme Court here in Brazil are accepting work in as third and fourth instances. I'm being very honest, but I'm not being offensive to the Supreme Federal Courts, but I think they've all agreed to be a third and fourth instance. If we look at what George Fisher thinks and ask about how the Supreme Court should act, I doubt that he will say that the Supreme Court should stop being supreme. It's still supreme. So those numbers are going against uh, what the Supreme Court should be doing. You know, the, the Supreme um, Justice Trib Tribunal, they are going on top of this, you know. So we have to value the first and the second instances. When 
those instances decided by analyzing facts and proof, we have to accept that the Supreme Tribunal Court should only be as, uh, you know, given a, a advising situation. And it's, I think, you know, we are trying to improve our ministry. But now, Desembargador Humberto Dalla, Judge Humberto Dalla, it's very interesting when we see the judges talking about this after working in the public ministry. This is good when we notice that you have worked in both systems. It's the time for us to remove all the labeling that we have. If the infraction has lower uh, per, lower offensive possibility, then we accept one way. If it's more, if it's a more dangerous process, then it can be suspended. We also have prized collaboration, which should be done through execution. And now the new CBP is bringing in plea bargaining, of course, with a different name. Oh, it's the time for us to install the possibility of an agreement, which is the plea bargaining, of course. So let's establish that. So, and we have to accept and which agreements should be accepted and the structure of the agreement should be discussed between the parts and accepted by the judge you have a safety, you have a participation from the judge, and then we stop creating a constellation of tools that will become very confusing and then say, I don't know which bargaining should I have. So I suggest that we should be able to make agreements, pre-processual agreements and processual agreements with the decisions made by the judge in a criminal policy. Apart from that, the parts involved in a horizontal field with efficient fiscalization from the judges will celebrate it. So I'm finishing without, of course, um, thanking Professor Fischer, Desembargador Humberto Dalla, and Sawit. Unfortunately, we couldn't hear from Fernando Curi, but next time. Hi, Professor Rogério. It's always a pleasure to listen to you. It was amazing. And I think it's time to overcome this dogma of an obligation in, in legal sentencing. I think we need a change, you're right. So, and if we all reflect about this, I also want to say everything that Professor Joss has said, and the, we need to follow what's gonna happen in the judicial court on the 6th. We need to follow on that. We have been seeking, um, accepting all the improvement in the criminal sentencing, and we should have more effectiveness for negotiation. By saying that, George Fisher, would you like to close off? Otherwise, would you like to say anything else, or should we just finish? I, I would like to say that I, I, I've learned a lot listening to all of you. I feel, very, I feel very honored to have been able to uh, listen in on this conversation. And I think um, it seems to be a very exciting time in, in the criminal procedure of Brazil. Uh, and the kinds of arguments you're having about, for example, artificial intelligence, as uh, Professor Salve raised and Judge Rogerio was talking about, um, assuring voluntariness on the part of the criminal defendant and those sorts of safeguards um, and interventions. I think these are all interesting questions and ones that um, I, I hope you will keep me informed as to how they develop in, in, in the debates that are now going on in Brazil. Uh, now that I know about them, I will follow them with interest. But thank you very much again.
Muito obrigado mais uma vez, professor Jorge. Thank you once again, Professor George. It was a gift to have your talk. And also hearing from our amazing colleagues here. And I am so happy that you've all participated. For closure, I'll pass on the word to the Zimbargador Caetano Levi Lopes. Good evening, everyone who are following us today. And good evening, special good evening to Professor George Fisher, to everyone, Humberto Dalla, Rogério Salve, Anderson. And before closing, I would like to know from Dr. Fernando if he can already say something. No. He's having a problem with his audio. Uh, how sad, that's very sad. He's having a technical problem. That's a shame because it would be amazing to also hear your message. But the National School of Magistrature here in Brazil, here it's uh, night, it's eight, almost 8 p.m. We are very honored with the participation and this amazing class that we got from Professor Fisher. I am not, I haven't been working actively, but I only act in the civil jurisdiction. I haven't been acting, working with criminal, but of course I teach process theory and I follow up as much as possible on these worries with the evolution of the penal processual law here in Brazil and the attempt to substitute our process code, penal process code, and we have the tradition of civil law from written legislation. So our penal process code, it's still from the 1940s. So it was updated in some occasions, but we have been needing a new code for a very long time. And a huge opportunity for whoever, maybe we can make people understand how important it is to unify all these institutions that we've talked about. The North American system as far as I know, in this aspect is the unitary, has just one institution. Here we have many. And truly, it, since the creation of all the, the criminal judgments, which happened at the end of 1995, you know, after the creation of all these criminal courts, we've been able to have some agreement in our courts. Before, it was too complex. If you were sentenced, you would get, you only had one choice, to follow your sentence. There was no possibility of any kind of agreement. So, in 1995, the law that came to discipline the constitutional rules brought this novelty at the time, which was predicted in the constitutional text, the possibility of agreement in executing the penal code or even an agreement to suspend the process. So from then onwards, some laws started coming up, and the most recent is what we've called premium dilation. But the unification of all this structure in just one institution would be very useful. I've learned so much from you, and the National School of Magistrature can only thank you. Thank, we need to thank Professor Fisher for all his dedication and spending his precious time 
with us here with all the judges and to Umberto Dalla with Dr. Rogério Chasson, she's Dr. Salve, and Dr. Anderson. So I want to say that we all finished this event feeling very happy and very glad to have joined. Thanks everyone for supporting us, our technical team, and I wish you all a great night. Thank you so much.